All right, I must admit I didn't study what they meant by the bioeconomy, so in my world it tends to be more bioenergy, so I'm going to talk principally on the bioenergy side. Um, and I'm supposed to talk about climate change, so let me just have a couple of slides on climate change. This is the January through the end of August record since 1880 up to 2016. Notice here out in 2016, um, there was a European goal at one point that we, we don't ever get, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, the, the European goal now, or the goal is about two degrees. It, we're approaching two degrees Fahrenheit. This is two degrees, um, well, the, the goal is two degrees centigrade, but by the time you get down here, we're getting close to that two degrees centigrade. And notice the last couple of years have been very warm um, with accelerated warming. This is the greenhouse gas record. Um, this one's up through this September. This one here only goes up to 2015. Notice you see here carbon dioxide in the atmosphere increasing dramatically. We passed 400 for the first time ever. When I started doing this in 1985, we were at 345. So in a 25-year or 30-year period, we've gone up on average somewhere around two points a year, or you know, we're getting up in the 20% range. The European goal was to stop dangerous climate change. We had to limit the carbon dioxide equivalent to less than 450 parts per million. Well, when you factor in nitrous oxide, methane, and the other non-CO2 gases, they had to abandon that particular goal because it was in the rearview mirror. Um, we're right. The number I found for 2015 was 485 parts per million. So we're rising dramatically, and there are a lot of implications of that. It also has some aquaculture implications because ocean acidification is really taking off and that causes, I think, particular problems with things that form shells. I don't know if shrimp are caught up in that, but certainly oysters and things like that are. Um, why, why worry about bioenergy? Well, if we look in the U.S. where our emissions come from, they're most almost exclusively from energy. Um, I think a couple years ago I had the number memorized that it was about 85 percent from energy sources and about 15 percent from others. Uh, projections. Projections are these. These are different degrees of what they call radiative forcing and it's really different greenhouse gas contents in the atmosphere. This one here is a continuation of business as usual. These here are, are more severe mitigation scenarios. And this one was invented at Disneyland, which is an immediate cessation of all <laughs> greenhouse gases. <laughs> Notice it doesn't, immediate cessation and this don't quite square up. Um, also, I was part of IPCC in 2007 and in 2014, and when we did this in 2000 and for the 2007 report, our actual numbers were to the left of this red line. So we're, we may be progressing at a faster emission rate than that red line shows. Although the last couple of years in the United States, we've leveled off a little bit with um, switches to natural gas principally and some more renewables. So given that background, what about the bioeconomy? Well, societally, there's three ways that we can act in the face of climate change. One way is to sit back and take it. This was the 2000 approach when we said we weren't going to do anything about climate change because we didn't have enough information. Um, the other one is a reducing drivers approach where what we try to do is reduce principally greenhouse gases, although there's some other things that we can do. And then the third approach is an adaptation approach. This is actually where I think agriculture is in the, the next 20 or 30 years because the mitigation is likely not to happen fast enough to really help us. Um, 
I think I have that a little bit later. If I don't, I'll go back. So I, I want to talk about these things. Well, the thing we think about the most when we're talking about the bioeconomy is on the reducing driver's side. So <coughs> let's look at the social cost of carbon. 85% of the emissions come from, uh, uh, or 85% of the emissions come from the energy sector. They, this is a carbon equivalent price, and the U.S. government ran a bunch of models and took a look at what would happen to the net present value of releasing one ton of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere in terms of the damages it does to global economic output and those sorts of things. And the estimates at a 3% discount rate in 2015, the cost of carbon is fairly close to $40. Here we see it rising to 50 and 71. If we have a low discount rate, it gets a lot more. If we have a little higher discount rate, it gets a lot less. But the, the basic point here is that there's a substantial cost of carbon. So in the bioeconomy, we can try to replace fossil fuels. We can try to replace coal, gasoline, diesel, or natural gas. I did these calculations three times because I didn't believe one of the numbers or some of the numbers I got. I think I'm right, but if we take a ton of coal, it releases 2.59 tons of carbon dioxide. Now remember, carbon dioxide is one carbon and two oxygens. It gets the oxygen from the atmosphere, so this isn't a net creation of, of matter. I think coal is something like 80% carbon, and that's why we get such a huge carbon increase. If we take gasoline, a thousand gallons of gasoline releases about nine tons of carbon dioxide, diesel it's 10, and a thousand cubic feet of natural gas releases a 20th of a ton. If I price this thing at $40, then the price of coal, which is currently about $40, goes up by 258%. The price of gasoline only goes up by 16%. That's the one I kept doing the numbers over and over again because I thought it should be a bigger one. And natural gas is about 73%. Well, what this means to me is if we're going to do something in the bioeconomy, why do we keep talking about bloody ethanol and that kind of stuff? We ought to go after the coal. It's a stationary source. It's you know, fixed in a location. If we replace this coal with burning wood or switchgrass or something, we get quite a large cost advantage relative to the coal under a carbon price. And it really is going to take a carbon price to make this happen. It, um, it's currently more expensive than coal to burn wood or something like that. The other thing is that if we burned wood, we could couple that with something like carbon capture and storage, and then you not only have positive, um, or you not only have emission reductions relative to coal, but you also have potential for going negative and actually on net removing stuff from the atmosphere. I did do some life cycle accounting a number of years ago to take a look at if we took various products and converted them into various energy forms, what kind of carbon offset would we get? Corn, I get 30%. I think others are 20 to 25%, but we're in that range. Um, for something like going into electricity, if we're doing 100% firing, we're at about 85%. If we're doing co-firing, that's actually more efficient. So you put a little bit of uh, biological material on top of the coal, and since the coal is burning so hot, it, it will burn it up more completely. Then we get up into the 90% range. Um, so again, it favors electricity. And one time I had a PhD student do a do a thesis, and at different carbon prices, uh, the carbon prices have disappeared. 
Yeah, they're not on this slide. I think this was like a $5 carbon dioxide. And over here, we're getting up into the 50 and 100. Notice the bioenergy offset became quite large at this point. Although this was almost exclusively electricity, there's just a little tiny bit of replacement of diesel and, and gasoline. Um, we also may have some policy forces that are forcing us toward mitigation. The Clean Power Plan was set up by EPA. It was finally fully proposed, what, last summer sometime, Vince, wasn't it? I think it was last August. Um, it has a national reduction of emissions 32% below 2005 levels. That's a little bit of cheating because all the wind in Texas, we, we have a lot of hot air in Texas, um, as some of our presidential candidates demonstrated clearly. Um, and um, all that came on since 2005. So Texas actually has a 36% goal, but by the time you factor in what already had with the wind, it's more in the 15% range, I believe. Um, the starting date of these emission reductions is 2022. The states were supposed to, by right now, file a plan, although they could get a one-year extension, I believe. Or was that two? It was one or the other. But the Supreme Court um, put everything on hold, I think, about in June, and we're not quite sure what's going to happen. This only covers existing plants. It does have market-based mechanisms. This is for electricity, um, and there are biogenic carbon rules. I helped write the ag part of that, and there are various hearings, and it's going through various processes. So um, there are a bunch of power plants now that are wandering around talking about co-firing with biomass. Um, we also have our our commitment to the Paris Agreement, where we're supposed to go 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025. Currently, we're on a trajectory, if we continue business as usual, to go 17 percent below 2005 levels by 2020. So um, there, the strategies, clean power plans, one, CAFE standards, California laws, and REGI, and then there's some state programs, and there's also the renewable fuel standard, although Vince can talk about that later. Um, I don't think we're making big progress on the cellulosic front in that at the moment. Um, so that's sort of my mitigation story. There's also some effects stories. If we're going to raise a bunch of feed for fish or, or things for bioenergy uh, feedstocks, we need to take a look at what climate change is likely to do to yields. And when we did the 2001 national assessment, this is what happened to yields throughout the country. And so this is a 24% increase in yields under something called the Hadley climate change scenario as it was formed in the year 2000. Here, these are different climate scenarios from different models. This is a one out of the England, UK uh, meteorological office. This is out of the Canadian. This is an Australian one. And I can't remember where that one's from, but it's somewhere or another. Um, and notice in the South, we tend to have the worst event uh, occurrences, but in the no more northern areas, we tend to have some benefits. Well, that, is gonna, that has some implications for how effectively we can grow these feedstocks and where we should be growing these feedstocks. What are these numbers? Percentage change in crop yields. Um, also, we've looked some at technological progress. This is U.S. corn yields. Notice up till 1970, I believe they were increasing by about 2.7% a year. Since then, that's dropped to more like 1.7%. We did some work where we tried to look at whether climate change was having a significant influence on this, and econometrically, we found that it was associated. Um, 
extremes. This is an index of climate extremes over the U.S. And notice we've had a substantial gro growth in climate change extremes during this period of strong upward growth in temperatures. So this implies a more variable agricultural production. And that's one thing you didn't mention on your supply chain is that you know, we have a 25% coefficient of variation on agricultural yields. That's really going to give them some problems with this really bulky stuff. Um, adaptation is the third thing I wanted to talk about. Well, notice here that we're sitting right about here. And between now and 2040, 2050, what we do in mitigation does not matter. No matter what we do to the greenhouse gases, we get about one degree of warming. That's why in agriculture, we got to figure out how to produce when it gets one degree warmer and not worry about the mitigation side. Only later do we get the mitigation effects. So we have a committed era between now and 2040 where we're just inevitably going to get about one degree. And then between there and the end of the century, we have choices depending on how much mitigation we're going to do. Um, and that means that bioenergy, bioeconomy is going to face that as well. Um, some data, this was out of, we did this two or three years ago. It, the average acre of corn in the United States has shifted north and west 150 miles between 1950 and 2010. Soybeans were 183 miles north and west. Wheat, 173 miles north and west. This means North Dakota's growing more corn than it used to. And should we be putting our biorefineries in North Dakota and forgetting about them in Iowa and Missouri and places like that? Um, there's also been a substantial conversion of cropland to pasture land. This is cropland. This is pasture. This is econometric results. As the temperature increases, the average for the year, what happens to the proportion of land in each of these uses? In Texas, it's switching out. Um, and that's going to have some pretty big implications. Adaptation, a lot of it is done by farmers in their own best interest. They call it autonomous adaptation in the literature, but it's really farmers acting on private goods. And, but there's a bunch of activities that may be public goods that the farmers won't address. And we're likely to have to invest more in research to overcome some of these things and provide information to people in North Dakota about how to grow corn, even though they never have, and develop stra adaptation strategies. And we also may have to influence natural adaptation by managing things we didn't manage. I, I think of an oil drum float for polar bears out off the Arctic ice cap so they can <laughs> still fish. Um, you know, something like that we may have to do. Climate change is going to continue, and it's, it raises a new demand on us in agricultural research. Traditionally, in the past business, we had to do a lot of maintenance research, and then we'd do improvement research. Well, in climate change, I think we're going to have to do a lot of maintenance research to maintain what we have at a position where we used to evolve. Uh, we used to spend much more time on yield improvement, and that means our research dollars go a lot shorter. So climate change has multidimensional implications. Bioenergy will face the effects. The carbon price may raise a large opportunity. Yield and technical progress um, raise, effects are going to raise risk. Adaptation will move the in industry north. We did a study that showed less dependence on the Mississippi River and more on rail going out as we move the corn further north and get away from the river. We'll see things like that. The fishing industry in Norway has been pulling the pens out of the southern area and moving them to the northern areas, but then they need to build airports and processing plants and things like that. And industry will need to fund some ad adaptation. So 
Thank you, Boo. You didn't wave five minutes at me, but I must have gone over.